Hi. <laughs> um, I, uh, this last book, Queen of America, that came out is the uh, second part of a long saga about my great aunt, the Santa Cabora, in Mexico, named Teresita Urrea. Um, we can talk about how these books came about. The first one's The Hummingbird's Daughter, the second one, Queen of America. I actually was going to call it Queen of New York because she lived on East 28th Street uh, between Madison and Lex, and she won a beauty competition. So she was for a little period Queen of New York, but we felt Queen of New York might have been a little too uh, limiting for the rest of the country. So that to tell you what the, the books are about and the life story of this woman, and I can tell you more if you're interested. She was a native healer, if you haven't read the books, uh, the, known as the Queen of the Yaqui Nation in Mexico. And in Queen of America, she falls in love, and her father uh, is very much against the romance. And the father, in the film that was supposed to start filming last April, but did not, was going to be played by, by Antonio Banderas, which was a great disappointment to my neighbors that there's no Banderas now. Um, but this is a quick scene from the novel to give you a flavor of their relationship. He was an outrageous hacienda owner. She was his illegitimate daughter who discovered miraculous gifts. He did not approve of her romance and tried to stop it. And the women in the house were so angry at him that they refused to speak to him or feed him or serve him meals. And he couldn't figure out how to get back in their good graces. So he decided that he would host a great dance, a great baile, fiesta, to try to make everyone happy. And uh, on special occasions, I try to do it from memory. So I'm going to do that for you uh, right now. The Saint of Cabora had fallen in love with Guadalupe Rodriguez in the mountains above Clifton, Arizona. Tomas, her father, had fallen afoul of the women of the home by rejecting the romance and fighting so savagely with his daughter. He knew that the only way to get back in the good graces was to start giving fiestas like they had known in Mexico in their old ranch. So the night of the fiesta, Teresita arrived with Guadalupe, tall and somber in his black suit. They entered the dance floor outside. Chinese paper lanterns were hung from cross ropes and from the trees. Over here, there was barbacoa, a goat. Over there, barbacoa of a cow. Over here, a great tub of sweet tamales made with cinnamon, honey, and raisins. A cumbia band from far Safford, Arizona, was there playing music, a tuba, a bajo sexto, a guitar, a violin. And the musicians rose and fell with the rhythms like the pistons of a meat engine. They were playing a song called Tiburon Tiburon. It was a song about a shark who was patrolling the coasts of Mexico looking for a victim to eat. But he was frustrated because all of the Mexicans had gone to a dance. So he gave up being a predator, jumped out of the water, and joined the dancing. Teresita and Guadalupe were being followed by her little sister, Anita. Teresita said to Guadalupe, Ay, Lupe, look at this. It's so beautiful. It fills my heart. Lupe, muy macho, said Teresita. I have no heart. <laughs> she said, Ay, Guadalupe, I'm going to have to teach you how to speak to a woman. You should say something to me like Teresita. I have no heart because you have filled my soul and carried it away. <laughs> and he said, Teresita, I have no soul. <laughs> Just then, Tomas made his entry. He rode his greatest black stallion. He had named the stallion after himself, Caballito Urrea. He had named all the livestock on the ranch after himself. There was a bull, Toro Urrea. There was a little green parrot named Periquito Urrea, who spent the whole day in his cage saying, Periquito, 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 Periquito. People said, the parrot is an egomaniac. <laughs> Here came Tomas on his black horse, dressed completely in black. He had silver conchas up his skin-tight pants. He wore twin Mexican 44s, cross draw in case he needed to shoot anyone. He wore a white frilled shirt and he wore a black jacket cut to his waist. On the cuffs and on the breast, stitcheries of red roses and on the back, a black satin scorpion. On his head, a vast black sombrero with silver threads and two little silver horseshoes on the crown. He rode in and the horse began to dance to the music in rhythm back and forth and the people said, 
Mira el patrón. He's so powerful. His horses know how to dance. Tomás pulled up, kicked his foot over the pommel, jumped down. His rowels on his spurs rang like little bells. He took his sombrero, dropped it on the head of a seven-year-old boy that covered his ears, and Tomás said, he is going to be king, my friend. <laughs> he walked to the center of the dance floor, didn't even look up, just snapped his fingers. <laughs> As if by magic, a coil of rope appeared in his hand. He looked at everyone, dropped the rope on the ground. There was a loop at the end, and he began to spin slowly, slowly, faster, faster. And the loop rose an inch off the ground. He stepped into it, stepped out of it stepped into it, stepped out of it, turned it up sideways, and it formed an oval window in the universe through which anything might step. The musicians faltered watching this. The people who were dancing on the floor stopped dancing to look. He saw a group of young women across the floor, and he sent the hoop toward them. They screamed and ran, laughing. He brought it back in the air. They sat down. He sent it back out to them. They ran again. He brought it back. This is when the wonderful thing happened. Without much motion at all, he jerked his hand above his head and formed a head tornado. He didn't look. He looked at the ground, bored. Because when you're macho, you've already done everything. You've done everything so well, it bores you. He stood like this. He looked across the dance floor and saw his daughter with her boyfriend. He dropped the hoop. It went down over her body, and he pulled the lasso tight. It closed on her. Everybody gasped. He began to pull her toward him. She pulled back. He pulled. She pulled back. Then, with a laugh, she surrendered, ran to him, jumped into his arms. Everybody applauded politely. He spun her in a little circle, and he leaned into her ear, and he said, Stay away from that bastard. <laughs> he took the rope off of her to great huzzas, great cries of joy. He started to walk away, and someone stopped him and gave him a copa of tequila. And he said, Viva Mexico! And he drank it put it down. Someone else stopped him and gave him a flag and a beer. He said, God bless America. He drank that and put it down. As he was moving on, somebody gave him a glass of wine. And he said, God bless Rancho Urrea. And he drank that. He walked to his horse to make his exit. But before he remounted, he turned back to the audience and he said, how did you like that, cabrones? <laughs> because you write, it's unusual, but you write nonfiction, and you've been celebrated for three, four genres, nonfiction, fiction, poetry, there's a graphic novel in there, um, children's, young adults is not far away, I feel. Yeah. Can you talk um, a little bit about how you got your start as a writer and how, how you managed to juggle all those different genres? Yeah, I, I was born in Tijuana, uh, and uh, I like to start, when I'm out on tour, I always introduce myself and say Tijuana in the house because <laughs> it makes me really happy to be the only Tijuana guy out there usually. Um, there could be others, you know. No, there are others, but not on my stage. So, um, uh, my mom was American. She was from here. She was actually from Staten Island. And uh, her mother, Louise Woodward, uh, had a, an antique shop here in Manhattan. One of their clients was John Steinbeck. So I was touched by the writing fairy before I was even born. Uh, and the family lived in Mattituck, Long Island. That's the Woodwards and my cousins. If you know them, work. They're my cousins. So, uh, and my dad was from Mexico. And they met in San Francisco. And he whisked her off. And I like to say, I think my mother thought she was going to a beautiful Mexican hacienda. Uh, and she ended up on a dirt street in Tijuana instead. Um, kind of a shock to her. She never got over it. But I was surrounded by all these fascinating people and hearing these incredible stories. And I realized that they were people who were disparaged and disrespected. And I didn't know that until we came to the United States. And I found out people looked down on Tijuana. And uh, certainly San Diego wasn't a place that was brimming over with lots of, gosh, we love Mexicans vibe, you know? What year was that? Uh, gosh, I was 
four and a half when we left, and then I, I moved to a little white working class suburb in, in uh, fifth grade. Um, and uh, that was a shock. I thought like this, you know, I, I, I had my Tijuana accent all the time. I spoke Spanish, first spoke English. And all of a sudden, I found out people didn't like it, so I began speaking like they did. <laughs> it was almost automatic. I thought, oh, work. being my dad didn't work. I'll be my mom now. It was really interesting. But it was a super blessing to me to, to, to get those two cultures at once. And they were equally, in fact, they were at war. Um, and we had this endless battle of the culture and language going on in our house. And my mom was winning because she had, you know, allies like Dickens and Mark Twain and Rudyard Kipling. And my dad could not find literature in Tijuana. I always tell this story, you've probably heard this, but my dad, it was so frantic to combat the perfidious influence of gringos on my mind that he went to Tijuana to find a Mexican book and he found a translation of the Odyssey. Iliad in the Odyssey, and he brought it home to me, and he said, I want you to study this in the original Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I had that thing, and we were very poor. I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't have clothes, was never going to get a car, didn't know how to dance. I didn't have any talent except stories. And so in junior high, I think I started to, to, to realize how much I loved it, and I was, I was crazy for you know, Jim Morrison and John Lennon and Leonard Cohen. Uh, and I thought, if I can, I, I'm going to be Leonard Cohen. That's what I'm going to do with my life, you know. So that's, that's how it started. When did it feel like writing? I think a lot of people dream of being a writer and scribbling away, maybe, um, in their private selves. But when did it feel like it was a career you could really pursue? And did your family push back against that? Oh, yes. Don't, don't, everybody who wants to be a writer, don't you hear those? I got, my favorite was, you know, writing is a hobby, not a career. <laughs> and I thought, okay, sure, yeah, so is being a rock star, so. Uh, I, I don't know, I just couldn't not do it. I don't think I ever thought of it as a career. Uh, I think Jeff professionalized me quite a bit. Um, you know, Little Brown, I can't say this, not, I'm not just kissing up to Jeff because he's sitting here, but they changed my life completely. But, um, you know, it, it was a love, and it was it was almost a religious process. I always tell my students I teach a lot, and I I I, I tell them, you know, I, I don't care about your career. I don't even care about your grade right now. I'm interested in you getting your black belt. I want you to get a black belt in writing, and it has a whole different pursuit than than writing something commercial. It's about the underpinning. So I I, I always loved it as a kind of a, a personal. Uh, way of being more than anything. And uh, being largely self taught, I think I was naive. You talk about the different genres. I was stupid. I didn't know that it. I thought it was. I thought it's like being a carpenter. You have to learn how to use every tool. So I thought, well, our job is to learn all of them and try to do them well. And then I found out people specialize. I thought, well, I could have saved myself so much time. <laughs> Um, you made, gave me a nice, easy segue to Jeff. Um, Jeff, will you tell us a little bit about how you got your start and, and whether um, publishing always seemed like a career option to you or how you came to it? Um, I got my start in a house full of books and a library, a really good public library, and I think maybe some of you are like this as well, or I have such a tactile memory of this library, which doesn't exist anymore, of mm -hmm. kind of learning uh, decimals, walking through, knowing which sections, and um, it was all very escapist for me because there was not, you know, it was not a city without culture. It was, because like, so it wasn't quite even a city, but, uh, you know, it was all, it was very distant stuff, and the library, I remember, had old books. So, um, movies, I love movies, but there was only one screen, and this was in the days where they didn't make a thousand, two thousand, three thousand prints. So you would wait forever, and uh, all the movie books in the library were old. So I would read mm. about movies from the '30s and '40s, and I only saw them when I was older. But um, just library, loved the library, loved it, loved it, loved it. I did not know these were careers to be found um, until uh, so much later. And I actually kind of came into it. Uh, very indirectly, and I wanted to get a job at Penn, the writers' group, 
and they rejected me and told me, <laughs> they told me, um, There's you know what? Now. They said, uh, you know what, you, you would have a better chance if you knew more about publishing, you should go get a job at a publisher and then come back. And, um, and that was a great favor they did because I got a really, ended up in a very good spot. And what was your first job? I was at Random House, a little random. And uh, I was there at a really fantastic time because I, I this was in the early mid 90s when the business was just exploding. It was really good times. The superstores were opening, so suddenly you had these miles and miles of shelves you had to fill. And people were ordering books, the economy picked up during the Clinton years. And it was, Random House was much smaller than it is now. It was before Burlesman bought it. And um, within the, I don't know, there might be Random House people here, but there were really <laughs> only two groups that mattered at Random House. It was Little Random and Knopf. And, um, and they were both very exciting places to be. And, and Random House at the time had this a constellation of, of editors. So there was a group of older editors who were all legendary. Um, some of them are no longer with us. Uh, there was a group, next tier of, of people that seemed so grown up to me, but actually probably younger than I am now a little bit, but who now run all sorts of other companies, and then a group of youngsters, who uh, many of whom have done well. So, um, so yeah, that was it. And then you just kind of have it or you don't, in a way. And the, so the training, uh, maybe like your training, like your training is you just, you read an extraordinary amount of work. Um, but you have not necessarily read unfinished work. And when you read a, a rough material, like a draft or something, you kind of either pick up what's wrong or what's not. So it was uh, felt right right away, and it's continued. So you both come from the West. Yeah, man. Represent. Um, <laughs> and I'm curious to hear how you feel like that has informed, for Jeff, the books that you've sought out or published. And Luis, how that plays a role in where you choose to set the books that you're writing. Sorry. Me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I, 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 until I was 26 years old, had never really been anywhere. Being a child of poverty um, and Southern California poverty dictated that if you went to the Grand Canyon, you'd gone back east, <laughs> right? And uh, that was about it. I'd gone to Mexico, I'd gone south a lot, but I'd never gone back east past maybe Yellowstone. That was as far as I got. And um, you know, I didn't get all this stuff about the world. I didn't get the stuff about the East Coast or what the deal was. And I couldn't figure out what my mother was going on and on about about New York, New York. Dude, give me the desert, man. You know, and uh, I, uh, m my father died actually 36 years ago today, believe it or not, um, uh, hideously in Mexico. And uh, I, I was I was in college and I didn't know what to do with myself. And I, I began working with a, a group of missionaries uh, in Tijuana, in Tijuana Garbage Dump. And uh, through some bizarre miracle, which I can't quite explain to you, I was. In the midst of all that, hired to teach writing at Harvard, um, expository writing, and uh, I, I, I was out here for the first time, and I, I thought I was going to die at first. I realized how cool it was. Um, she realized how cold it was. Well, I, I, okay, okay. Here's here's a hick confession. I had not seen snow before. <laughs> And the first day it started snowing, I was in my apartment in Somerville, Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh. And uh, I was talking to someone on the phone, and I looked out the window, I put my glasses on, and I said, dude, someone's on the roof shaking out a pillow. <laughs> and she said, what did you say? I said, there's feathers. And she said, you're a moron, that's snow. That's how much of a dick I was. But I carried that stuff internally with me, and it just, I think it sets, uh, you know, it sets a, a, a pace, and I've learned as a, as a writer, I think as a writing teacher too, that for me, uh, internalizing the place until it becomes mythic it, within you is what the secret is for me to enter the writing trance to do it. You know, we just met Charlene Harris, you know, and we told her, hey, we used to live in Louisiana too. And she was like, well, it's not quite the Louisiana I write about. I was like, no, but, you know. <laughs> but we realized that Louisiana is starting to show up in my writing. Did you see my story? So 
uh, I think places go in and stay. And um, a lot of times I'm seen as, you know, and I've been called this a couple of times. Even Bill Moyers called me the, the voice of the border, which I got to say was never my intention. I was never going to be border boy. Um, but I realized that in my household, you know, with the Mexican side, the American side, who weren't getting along, I've always had the border right through the middle of my life. So the internalized metaphor of border fascinates me, and it's really vivid in the Southwest where we're from. Um, and now that I, I've lived in Chicago quite a long time, and I'm seeing, realizing finally in my life that borders are everywhere. It's not just, you know, a fence along a line, an imaginary line between two countries or different barrios or towns, you know, but actually there are borders that interweave every audience I speak to. So I think the West for me represents all kinds of deeper m metaphoric resonance and feels like my territory. You know, that's the place where I, I, I grew up and I have my roots planted and uh, I left there and it gave me the world. But I think that, that stays inside. And does it make you, it must be, make you feel <coughs> particularly comfortable to work with an editor who's familiar with the West and have that connection with? Totally. <laughs> totally. I, you know, Jeff, we got to know each other because the devil's highway. And uh, we were kidding around in his office just now. You know, people ask me, they, they get very mystical with me because of the subject matter of a lot of my books. And they say, you know, what, what moved you to write this book about the Devil's Highway and this crisis on the border? And I say, well, Jeff Chandler gave me an assignment. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what came about? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't really God. <laughs> you know, it was Jeff who, who gave me an assignment. And honestly, I didn't want to do it because I'd already done several border books. And I thought I'm done with that. And the responsibility for all the death was too great, I thought. But as Jeff pointed out, if you don't do it, who's going to do it? I thought, well, damn right. I better go do it. So, But that's how that happened. And that book totally changed my life. And that story was particularly interesting to you because of where you come from? or because I mean, some of it. I think my sense of the West is that the West has always been marginal. Um, like literally marginal as as colonization, you know, from the east went there, from the south went up, the sun going across, <laughs> but, you know, uh, as you go across, and then culturally, you know, you're out there, you know, if you're in the big cities, in the in the west coast, you're out there in a, in a very geographic way, but if you're further in, as I was, um, you definitely feel apart and distant, and I think that. Um, you know, there, there was a great cultural distinction. I'm sure it still exists, uh, even though now you can get online and, and you're very much tapped into culture all over. Um, but I think one of the things that drew me to Luis's work is that he looks very closely at margins. I mean, years in border is a word, and that border is different. But, um, you know, the marginalized as well as margins. And, um, in the case with the Devil's Highway, which for those of you who don't know is about a group of walkers who are trying to get to the United States and there's just terrible calamity and, and there's a great die off. Um, which, and I don't know if this was in your bio, did you say it was a Pulitzer finalist? It was a so it was. finalist for the Pulitzer. So, it was um, in your bio. So, uh, Darn it, Julie. Yeah. There's too many books to lift. Um, I read that story. I, at the time, there was a vogue for, uh, it was after crack hour and Sebastian Younger, and there was like a renaissance of these disaster books. And there were many of them, and it struck me, perhaps uh, with the exception of Younger, they were often um, very upper class in their, in their characters and their people. Uh, very rarely did they look at working class, and very rarely, if ever, did they look at, at people who were not white. Um, and it was, it was intriguing to me, and I thought, I read about this story, I don't know where, um, and obviously, I was very interested in that part of the world and the border. And, um, you know, it was just incredible, incredible um, emotional <coughs> resonance to these stories. I mean, Luis, Luis writes a lot of this kind of stuff, but this is like a grail quest for these people. Yeah. I mean, it, they are searching and they are desperate and amazing folks. So I read about this and I thought, like, well, I always want to do more books about this part of the world. And it's very hard in New York publishing to convince anyone that the West is worth worth publishing. Um, it's surprisingly challenging, very difficult. 
But I thought, you know, what if I um, see this as um, the perfect storm? Or into thin air, what's the big difference? You know, it's an adventure, it's got great characters. Um, and actually, by framing it that way was part of how I think I got it through mm -hmm. at Little Brown. Um, and, uh, you know, once I read the story, I thought, who could write it? And Luis's um, pieces about the dump, which were collected, and I, I just, those were staggering to me. It was just, they're, they're unbelievable. I mean, they're not for sale here, but it's just a, un, oh my goodness. You guys will read that. It will shake you, seriously. It's a 10, 10 year anniversary. No, but this is before, this is for oh, the before, Lake of Seeds. Yeah, yeah, Devil's Highway is, is uh, coming up on 10 years. That, that other, those other ones are from 93, yeah. 93. Right. So, so it was like, um, um, but basically, um, yes. The fact that we grew up in the West, the fact that um, I grew up with a lot of Spanish around me, um, we know all the foul language, he doesn't have to translate it, um, <laughs> and uh, a desire for more books about that, that part of the world, so that was all there. Um, and I don't know, I guess temperament or some of it. I mean, you know, if you're in the West, I mean, I was in the, I was in the high desert, I was in the low desert, but you're okay with uh, quiet. You know, and I think that's an asset as well for both writing and reading. And his books are, Lisa's books are incredibly vibrant. You know, as you, as you heard that, they're very effervescent and incredibly colorful. I mean, you do a lot of kind of reconstitution of things. And, and I, I'd say the, your attention to the marginal and projecting down also involves um, the physical. You know, the details you create about a place um, are just very, very important. You know, you're not minimalist, but I think you're Western. No. <laughs> but I think you're Western in um, a kind of expansiveness of, of perspective and sensibility. And I think that's true for your nonfiction and your fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think there's a theme there. I mean, you know, I was really shocked when I started doing Devil's Highway. One of my tasks was to find a way to penetrate the U.S. Border Patrol. And honestly, you know, they were not interested in me showing up, and they gave me four months of runaround. And when I got there, they tormented me mightily. And um, but you know, I, I talk about marginalized. I didn't realize going in. I thought my my story was going to be these men who died horribly in the desert, abandoned, and nobody caring. When I found out that the border patrol dwells out in a far margin of their own, and they were eager to have a voice as well. I was stunned. And I, I, it was transformative for me to realize that I've always seen myself as a writer of witness, um, but I wasn't going to witness those bastards I didn't like very much. And I, I was a worse writer for that. And when I realized that those guys um, moved me in profound ways and were worthy of being witnessed as well, I had to really revamp my view of the world. That um, if you're going to open yourself now to witness and to represent people as best you can, I think that you, you have to forfeit the prejudices. I didn't know I had it. I thought I'm, I'm prejudice free, except for you. <laughs> and uh, you know, they taught me a lot. And uh, it, was, it was a tough lesson, but it, it's interesting to me that you know, now I, I have, they're always really wonderful and, and supportive and guys that you'd never think would be, you know, advocates of my like border patrol agents are now. They they study the book of the academy. Um, I've had this amazing thing happen recently of a border patrol agent in the United States married to a Mexican national who is now in trouble with the government is asking me to help in the trial to keep her here and I thought <coughs> Wait a minute, you're coming to me for help? Because your own system's messed up your family. This is amazing. <laughs> you know, who knew when you were sitting typing that that would happen? It, it, it's incredible. So, uh, you know, that's, and, and in some weird way, that to me is kind of an, an, a classic, weird Western paradigm, you know? Yeah, At some yeah. moment, the marshal has to come to the gunslinger and say, hey, can you help me? Well, that's great. You're going you, you from witness to expert witness. Expert witness! Uh, oh, I like that. <laughs> I mean, I just should add, like, we, we're going on about the, the West. Um, because it is the greatest part of the world, right? Um, but I mean, of course the books work because they could be anything, anyone. I mean, they're, they're very identifiable. 
I would say, in some way or another, uh, all of us come from stories of migration. Oh, yeah. And even New York, in its way, you know, there's this great Edward Said thing about New York being a city of exiles, and that everyone here is either for work or because their family came here. And I think that's something that, that is very touching with that book and in and, and all your books, in a way, they're your own quest for mm -hmm. answering certain questions. You know about whether it's yourself and where you come from, but also going places, doing things, and in a very metaphysical sense as 